How to properly bulk whilst gaining minimum fat. If you try to absolutely minimize fat gain during a bulk, then you will also be absolutely minimizing muscle gain. So yes, if you follow Greg Doucette, stop main gaining. If you main gain, you are gaining minimal fat. You are also gaining minimal muscle. All right, guys, we've got something a little bit different today. The Progressive Physique Coaching family has been growing on YouTube lately. And it turns out you guys have some very, very good questions. Maybe you are smarter than I thought. Shock. But anyway, because of that, I wanted to put a video together answering some of your questions. So hopefully I can help some of you guys out, give you more value than just in the kitchen like normal. So I posted over on my YouTube community tab. If you didn't see it, then you're probably not subscribed. So make sure to hit that subscribe button. And I asked you, hit me up with your questions. Some really, really good ones came in. And today I'm gonna to sit down and take some time to answer them for you. I've got my laptop here with the questions on because I've got a terrible memory. I've got my shaker bottle filled with some water because I get a dry mouth. And I've got some cool lighting going on behind me because it increases the content quality. And that is what we're all about on here. Progression in all aspects of life. But anyway, enough waffling out of the way. We're going to go straight into question one. And this will be on the screen here. And this is, have you considered hiring a coach to aid in the bulking season? So, yes, your boy is bulking. I know, it's obvious that I need to bulk because I'm tiny. But if you haven't been following along for that long now, you'll know that a couple months back, I competed in my first ever bodybuilding show. It was men's physique. I placed third in the juniors category and it was an incredible experience. I had the best time of my life. I 100% caught the bug for bodybuilding. I loved it. I'm definitely gonna do it again, but I'm giving myself a lengthy off season to build as much size as possible. Whilst I'm talking, I'll put some pictures on the screen of that show just to give you an idea of how I was looking because remember these pictures. In two years time, I'm gonna crush them and make that guy look like a little bitch. But this guy that asked the question, I really appreciate the question. I don't mean it in a, mood way, in a rude way at all, but he's not watching enough of my videos because if he did, he would know that I have hired a coach. I am working with Steve Hall from Revive Stronger, yes. So I'm not just working with a coach. This is no budget coach, this is no normal coach. It's freaking Steve Hall from Revive Stronger. He is one of the top guys in the industry. Working alongside him has been absolutely incredible. The knowledge this guy has is just ridiculous. I've been a fan of his for so long. So if you don't know who he is, then you need to, you need to go and check him out. But yes, I am working with a coach. It is Steve Hall, it is going incredibly. He calls me out on my bullshit. That is one of the main things for having a coach. The motivation from working with somebody that I look up to, someone of that caliber, is worth its weight in gold. And there's other things, like I learn more about programming. I try different exercises. I have somebody to be accountable to. He also helps me get a more objective rather than an emotional uh, view on weight gain because yes, after a show and in general, seeing numbers go up on a scale and seeing yourself get a bit fluffier can be a bit daunting for a lot of people. You get that adipose phobia creeping in and having that external view of somebody very objective that's not in your head. Uh, yeah, that's super beneficial. Thank you for your question. Moving on. Yo dude, I often hear people training with reps in reserve. What are the benefits of this? I redline every session either through volume or amount of weight. Would it be beneficial to do it another way? My God, is this a can of worms. But yes, I train with reps in reserve. This is goes. This follows on nicely from the previous question about my coaching, because that is something that I've implemented with Steve Hall, where week one, I'll start with higher reps in reserve and each week the reps in reserve will get progressively lower until I'm eventually training to failure. And this guy is basically saying he used to train to failure every single session. Uh, why, is, is there a benefit? Is he missing out on something? And I would say yes, because I've been there as well, where I was going to failure every single set, every single session, and I thought I was doing the best I could. And training smart doesn't mean training hard. So my personal experience so far with training in terms of reps and reserve, it's given me a much more 
predictable and consistent progression. Before, I would be trained to failure and I would just be smashing my head against a brick wall. The fatigue induced by training to failure makes overload nearly impossible. It's almost like if you go into the gym and do your one rep max every week, your one rep max probably won't go up very much because you don't get stronger when you're seeing how strong you are. You get stronger when you are training to get stronger and then every few months you test how strong you are. Same thing with hypertrophy training. If all you are doing is going to failure to see how far you can push it and never pulling back, you're not gonna be able to push it as far when you do see how far you can push it. Now that I actually only go to failure for one in every five weeks, I've realized that what I used to think was training to failure actually wasn't training to failure because that fatigue builds up so much when every single session is bam, bam, bam. And you think you're pushing as hard as you actually can, but you are so centrally fatigued, your mind, you just have so much systemic fatigue that you can't push anywhere near as much. Whereas when you start at three or four reps in reserve and build it up over the weeks, that final week, you go further into failure than you ever thought capable. I've seen God on a hack squat multiple times, I swear to God. And I thought I was training hard before that, no, I've, I've, I've been reborn on a hack squat and I loved it. Basically, when you are chronically fatigued, when you are just always redlined in terms of fatigue, you are too fatigued to actually go to muscular and technique failure because you are going to systemic fatigue failure first. I think that makes sense. The biggest misconception with reps and reserve training is that it's easy that week one, when you're three or four reps in reserve, is easy. No, if you train with reps in reserve, if you train three reps in reserve and it's easy, then you're not three reps in reserve. Because I'll tell you now, most people that you see trying hard in the gym are probably at about four or five reps in reserve. And that's why they're not making much progress. A true three reps in reserve is damn hard. Two reps in reserve is killer. One rep in reserve, you're nearly dying. Zero reps in reserve, you're dead. Look, training with reps in reserve isn't for everyone, but right now it is for me. If it's not for you, then don't do it. I don't care. Thanks for your question. The next question we have got is what ways would you recommend to maintain tendon health slash rehab tendons? And I just want to put it out there and say, I'm a personal trainer, but I'm not a physio. I'm not a doctor, anything like that. But it is quite a timely question because I have just been dealing with some tendinopathy. Tendi uh, I have just been dealing with some tendinopathy myself in the ischial tuberosity. What the hell is an ischial tuberosity? It's basically the tendon that connects between your hamstring and your butt, and it hurts like mad when you have tendonitis there. Yeah. That happened. So basically, I've got some overuse issues from doing hip hinges, such as Romanian deadlifts and good mornings. Probably went a little bit too deep, something like that, didn't warm up properly. And I pissed off my tendon massively. It was not healthy and I had to rehab it. So I don't know the best scientific way to rehab and keep your tendon health, but I know exactly how I approached fixing my hamstring tendon because now it's fine. So I will take you through the process of what I did. The first thing I did was stop the movements causing pain. If your tendon is pissed off when you're doing Romanian deadlifts, doing more Romanian deadlifts is not a good idea. So completely eliminate the movement. The tendon is inflamed and angry. You need to leave it alone until it's not inflamed and angry again. And tendons take a long time to heal. They have low blood flow. Unfortunately, this will be quite a long process. Now, once you've removed the exercise from your training, you need to find other ways to keep blood flowing into that area. So I couldn't do any hip hinges, but I could do curls because that's knee flexion rather than a hip hinge. So I did hamstring curls for days. It kept blood in that muscle. It kept it working. And also I kept the area warm. I foam rolled my hamstrings. I used heat pads. All of these things helped blood flow to the tendon and helped it recover. I did not do hip hinges for four weeks during my training program until my hamstring started to feel better. I then had a complete deload week. So we're now on five weeks without any hip hinging. And last week I have just done my first session of hip hinging and it felt 
fine, but I still took it very easy and that is the next step. If you are rehabbing tendon issues, you have to take it easy. I did not go in three or four reps in reserve like I was previously talking about. I was probably about 10 reps in reserve. It felt like a warm up, but if I did go in at three reps in reserve, the chances of me having a repeat injury are gonna be just super high. So go in easy. I hadn't trained it for five weeks. It's going to be hypertrophic, whether it's three reps in reserve or 10 reps in reserve. You basically get those newbie gains when you first reintroduce it. Aside from that, when it comes to preventing tendon injuries, there are a few things you can take care of. The first one is going to be exercise selection and volume. You want to do exercises which agree well with your tendons. If you every time you do a bench press, the tendons in your shoulders feel like shit, then it's probably not good for you. And especially if you're doing a ton of volume on it, maybe do more volume on the ones which feel a bit nicer on your connective tissues, your tendons, all of that kind of stuff. The next thing is gonna be your technique. If you're doing, again, let's talk about a bench press and you bounce and bounce and bounce. Think about that impact on your tendons. If you're doing a squat and you're bouncing in and out of the hole, that puts so much shock onto your tendons. Slow it down control the tempo, controlled reps, lighter weights, higher rep ranges, all of these things are gonna help preserve the health of your tendons. Thanks for your question. The next question is, could you explain how exactly you proceed with a mesocycle? There's a lot of training based questions. I was honestly expecting most of these questions to be recipe related, and I don't think a single one of them is, which is surprising for a recipe channel, but I'm liking it, I really like it. So yes, I can explain how exactly I proceed with a mesocycle. The first thing is I will start with my low set volumes and I'll be three to four reps in reserve. That means for every set that I do in week one of a training cycle, I feel like I could get another three to four reps if I push to failure. And that is because that level of training after a deload is still going to induce hypertrophy. It's still going to be enough to stimulate muscle protein synthesis. So you want to eke out those gains because next week you need to do a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more until you deload again and resensitize to the training intensity. Um, in terms of volume, I set it low. You're basically training to find your minimum effective volume. This is the minimum amount of volume that basically feels like you've done something, but not a lot. You're gonna have a little bit of a pump. Your muscles are gonna feel a little bit tired, but you're gonna feel like you could have done another set or two. And that is where you wanna start. Typically, I'm doing two to three exercises, about two sets per muscle group at this stage. Then weeks two, three, four and five, I am slowly adding intensity by adding a little bit of weight, the smallest increment possible, so 1.25 kilogram plates. I think those are two and a half pound plates on each side. And then I am adding a rep if I can't add weight. For example, you're not gonna add weight to your lateral raises every single week, that'd be ridiculous. So instead I'm adding a rep. But your bench press, your squat, your deadlift, your leg press, you can easily add weight to those every week, or you should be able to if you're training correctly at three to four RAR. So that is what I will do. I will add weight. If I can't add weight, I will add reps. After five weeks, if you have timed your three to four reps in reserve properly, you will hit failure at week five, but you're going to do that regardless. Then week six, you deload. In a deload, the first half of the week, I reduce my volume by half. So half the reps, half the sets and I will do the same weight of my exercises. And then the second week of a deload, I will also half the weight. So it is literally like the most gentle warm up ever. The point of that is to resensitize my muscles to hypertrophy. And it also gives you that release from the fatigue so that you can come in super fresh, get stronger, realize those gains and smash it for another mesocycle. That is how I progress my mesocycles. If you have any questions on that, let me know in the comment section and I will try my best to answer in a bit more detail because there is a lot to, that I could potentially go into when it comes to progressing a mesocycle. <sighs> Thanks for your question. The next question is, what are your thoughts about training during getting the big C, the C19 that I can't say in YouTube? Should you train or not? If so, should you just kind of do deload days? Should you skip it altogether? If you do skip it altogether, when do you go back at it and how? And again, this is a super complicated question. I'm not a doctor and don't take my advice. This is just for entertainment purposes. 
But if you're positive and you have absolutely no symptoms, then I personally don't see why you wouldn't train just because you're positive. If you feel absolutely fine, then train. Yeah, knock yourself out. If you feel very rough, then deload or just do nothing. So either do very easy training or do no training at all. Yes, you might lose some muscle in that time. You might lose some strength, but it will come back within like two weeks. So don't stress about it. Get yourself healthy first. If you just feel a little bit rough, but not knocked out from it, then you could try and train at maintenance levels. So, you know, probably half the amount of sessions with half the amount of volume you'd usually do. Low volume, lower intensity work to maintain where you're currently at. Or, you know, you can just deload again, even if you just feel a little bit rough, because sometimes it's best to be safe rather than sorry. When you do go back to your training, I'd recommend returning to it just like you would after a normal deload. So start around four reps in reserve. But I would say to err on the side of caution, I'd rather you not push it hard enough in those first few weeks back than push it too hard when you've been out of the gym for quite a while. Auto-regulate set volume based on how you feel, the pumps you're getting, stuff like that. Start easy and each week add a rep, add some weight, progress from there like a normal mesocycle. Thanks for your question. The next question is how can we build muscle at home during lockdown? And I hate to be the guy that answers a question like this, but you build muscle at home in lockdown the same way you build muscle in the gym because muscle is always built through the same thing. Regardless of where you are, whether you're at home or if you're in the gym, it is overloading muscular tension that is gonna cause muscle growth. As long as you're eating well, you are overloading, you are supplying mechanical overload, mechanical tension to the muscle, then you will grow. So if you are training at home during lockdown, all you need to do is find exercises which are hard and will challenge you that you can overload. Movements which disrupt the target muscles. Do they give it a pump? Do they make it tired? Do they make it sore? If you, if yes, and you can do more of it each week, then you're gonna build muscle. So for example, push-ups, are they too easy? Okay, stack your hands on chairs, put your feet up on chairs, wear a rucksack with some heavy ass stuff in it. You now have massively deep deficit push-ups. Do one or two more reps each week, add something a bit heavier on your back each week, and boom, you're progressively overloading at home. You don't need a gym, you just need to follow the actual principles of what causes muscle growth, and that is progressive tension over a long time. Thank you for your question. And we have the last question of the day, which is good because my throat is getting tired. How to properly bulk whilst gaining minimum fat? I'm loving these training questions. I'm so glad I got some of these. So the first thing you need to understand is that when you're trying to gain weight, when you're trying to bulk, when you're trying to build muscle, some fat gain is always going to be necessary if you are anything more than a beginner. It's just part of the course. You need to accept it, you need to understand it, and this goes back to why I've got a coach. If you try to absolutely minimize fat gain during a bulk, then you will also be absolutely minimizing muscle gain. So yes, if you follow Greg Doucette, stop main gaining. If you main gain, you are gaining minimal fat you are also gaining minimal muscle. You are literally spinning your wheels. Do not get ab anxiety, stop main gaining. So instead of looking to gain the minimal, the smallest amount of fat possible, look at gaining the minimal amount of fat whilst gaining the maximal amount of muscle. That is the place we wanna be. Even if that position was 0.1 of a pound per week. Nobody can actually accurately track that on a scale. It is impossible just because of day-to-day fluctuations. Did you have a piss in the morning? Did you drink an extra cup of water the night before? You can't track such slow progressions. You also need to remember that losing fat is so, so much easier for your body to do in every way than building muscle. So why try and stop your body from doing something that is easy to undo and make it harder for your body to do something that is hard to do? Again, stop main gaining. Do yourself a favour and give your body what it needs to build muscle rather than trying to trick the system. 0.25% of body weight per week 
it's the low end of what I'd recommend gaining per week if you are looking to build muscle. If you actually do the maths, you'll see that's actually a very small amount of weight. We're, no, we're by no means getting fat here, but you will eventually need to cut. It's not like we're main gaining. The top end is 0.5, so double the low end. If you are newer to training, if you're more on that early intermediate beginner side of things, go on the higher end because you can build more muscle faster. If you're more advanced, go on the lower end, the 0.25, because you're closer to your potential and you'll be gaining slower, so you can afford to gain weight a little bit slower as well. You've got to remember that the more muscle you have, the better you will look with that amount of fat. So take a short-term hit in your abs, in your definition, for those long-term gains of looking sexy at 15, 20% body fat, it's very possible you'd be surprised what looks good when you've got a lot of muscle mass. That is all the questions for today. Thank you so much. Let me know if you enjoyed this because I would love to do more of these. If you do have more questions for future Q&As, drop them in the comment section below, send them to you on Instagram, email me, ash at progressivephysiquecoaching.co.uk. Check out my website, progressivephysiquecoaching.co.uk for all the information on my online coaching. If any of the training related stuff I spoke about today is of interest to you, I'll be happy to help you out with your training. Thank you for watching. Until the next one, see you later, guys.